seen him before, but he was working for Al Balcom, Al Balcom, that's running for Congress, and uh, he is from Ground 40, Ground 40. Mm -hmm. he's staying there now, his mother and them are somewhere about two or three hours away from here, Yeah, but a nice young man, he seemed to be very well settled down, he, I, I don't know where he said he used to drink or what, but uh, well, Mark would serve me up with the talk to him voice. Well, I, uh, at one time I was trying to assault with a deadly weapon. Oh, yes. Oh, Mark can't be. I did, we did. He didn't bother me on that one. He'd be ashamed. He's yeah. dead. Wow. Giving his life to Jesus. Yeah. Oh, awesome. He's right. straightened it out. That's, That's great. great. Just a very nice young man, soon to be. That's good. Yeah. yeah, that's a testimony for sure. Anyone else? Um, I got one. Yeah, nice. Uh, a lot of you guys know I was looking for employment the last like six months or so. Circle K killed me, so I had to get out of there. But uh, I've been in the interview process for Waxhaw Baptist Church at a, as a part time worship minister uh, since December. And we had an in person interview a couple weeks ago with all the elders. Uh, and I got in there and we really vibed. And the pastor found out that I had done a youth slash worship position at another church I did uh, in college, and he got really interested in that. And so, this coming Sunday, I'm, or tomorrow, I'll be leading the, the youth group oh. um, and sort of a trial period. So, oh, that's uh, awesome. hopefully, in the way it's looking, I'll, I'll be a full time youth and worship pastor down at Waxhaw. Yeah, that's awesome. Because that's better known as Round Top Baptist. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. That being said, I do need a couple references. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <that's laughs> what I'm trying to do. I'm using you for that. So any, any volunteers? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Daniel. 
That is good news. Any other praises or testimonies you'd like to share? I'd like to thank the Lord for touching me this week. I went here last Saturday because I, um, I had COVID. <laughs> but that lasted for about three days, and uh, all is well. And God has rushed over us and blessed us and gives us good health. So I'm thankful for that. Too. Yeah. I'd like to share praise for, for Hannah being the best mom in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and also, uh, we had a uh, really good Ash Wednesday service on, on Wednesday. I know I've had to explain to all my Baptist friends what Ash Wednesday is, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it is an uh, <clears throat> it, it uh, exciting What did you tell them? What did I tell them? Uh-huh. What did you tell them about Ash Wednesday? Oh, about Ash Wednesday? I said it's, it's, I, <laughs> I said it's a service where you get ashes on your forehead, and um, I said it begins the, the 40-day Lent period. Where you you know you fast something and you're anticipating Easter and uh, but then I always would I, then I would go into my explanation as to how I presented the message I said because you know uh, we we Ash Wednesday to Easter is how we normally look at things we're looking for the resurrection but uh, in all reality the resurrection's already happened so we have the ascension where Jesus goes into heaven and I said we already know that's happened. And we have the anticipated return. We're looking forward to Jesus' return. And so we need to be fasting for uh, his return and serving him. So that's that's how I, I told it. But uh, um, you, I don't know how specific you want it. But there it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, one of the challenges was, and the reason why uh, we have these pictures on here too, um, we, you know, one of the challenges was, and on Ash Wednesday, and this is still carrying forward. I want, I really want to encourage this. Is where you put a, you, you have a, an ash cross on your forehead, and it shows uh, symbolism, really, that you know you carried the cross of Christ, and uh, that you, you know, you came into this world as dust. You're going to return uh, as dust, and so um, all of this, you know. This symbolism that it is, I think, is a real big encouragement for us to carry forth the cross in our daily life and everything. So, you know, if you think about it with an image, uh, if you had a cross on your forehead for 40 days long, every time you went to the convenience store, every time you went to uh, do the drive-thru or you went to the bank or whatever it is, people would notice you have a cross on your forehead. Um, and that would always generate conversation. And so my challenge for the church is to uh, get out. And so every Saturday at noon, we go to Waxhaw. We're going to go to Waxhaw uh, in downtown like we did today. And we're going to hold up signs because we're stating what we believe. We're showing our belief. Um, we, that's what we're doing. We're showing it. And so just the same as if you had a cross in your forehead. We're showing who we believe in, what we believe in. And then uh, also we're doing that on Wednesdays in Monroe, downtown Monroe by the, the government buildings uh, on Main Street. Um, so we'll be doing that at noon on Wednesdays. Um, so so we're going to continue doing that throughout the Lent, Lenten uh, 40 days. So, But yeah, that's a really... A, it was a very, I was very encouraged by the service we have. We combined um, folks from this service, folks from Prospect, Walkersville Presbyterian, and Walkersville showed up, man. They had a lot of people there. And then... Um, Oh, they brought a bus. Okay, so we might need to we might need to get the bus for a Good Friday when we go to Walkersville. But what time is the service? I believe all the services will be at seven o'clock. Oh, okay. Well, then good. Um, the others will be at six thirty. Okay, Okay, yeah, that's something we can figure out later. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we're going to be um, going through this Lenten series uh, with all of our churches together. So pretty excited for that. And um, looking forward to sharing the gospel uh, twice a week for until Easter. So uh, plan on doing it uh, more after Easter too. But uh, but right now that's the current agenda. That's the current agenda. Let's get forty days through first. But uh, but anyway, um, any other testimony? Any other praises? Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Dear God, thank you so much for what you've done on the cross for us, Lord, that we are sinners, we uh, have fallen short of your glory, but Lord, because you sent Jesus to this world to die on the cross, raised from the dead, Lord, 
you have forgiven our sins. Because if we believe in you, then we are forgiven, then we are atoned for. And Lord, we have that uh, eternal glory to look forward to. And so God, I just pray that we, um, during this time, during this service tonight, uh, can reflect and focus on, on the repentant heart, uh, on, the, on the new uh, creation that you've made. Lord, I just pray that we abide in your grace, we abide in who you are. God, I pray your blessings over the service. Use it. Glorify your name. Uh, Lord, that uh, that we can be challenged and commissioned to do the work that you've called us to do. Lord, I just thank you so much that the gospel is good news. That it is good news. And it's a news to be proud of that we can go, we can take it far and wide to share it with others. Lord, I just thank you so much for that truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and stand up and join in singing our first song.
teaching me this, showing me this, or whatever, you know, that, that's, that's where I feel like I am right now with my, with reading the Word, and it's just, you know, I'm just so thankful for it, um, but, uh, you know, in the song, you know, I, mine goes completely blank, but I remember talking about setting the captive free, and, you know, that's just, that's the reality, that's, that's my story, uh, that I was, I, I was in, in chains, I was, I was in bondage to my sin, but Jesus set me free. And the truth is, is that if you believed in Him, that is your story too. It's so amazing. But uh, today um, we got a prayer request. So, uh, prayer request. What do we have? Many things we need to lift up in prayer. Yes, John. Well, believing in prayer, I need some this week. Okay. I've been asked to lead the Bible study for our group on Tuesday. Oh, amazing oh, prayer. You're going to do a great job, John. I know that. So it'll be Tuesday. You're doing that. Yeah, for Joyce Blythe. For Joyce Blythe. Yeah, she's, she's got to open. Yeah. She's got to open. Okay. If, some, if someone here can remind me, I'm, I'll be there, John. Okay. <laughs> yes, Susan. And Kathy Schultz has had another accident with her leg. Okay. So All right, Kathy Schultz. It looks horrible. Yeah. Keep her in her certainly. Keep Mike Rape on. Mike Rape, yes. Definitely keep Mike Rape. Um, Tommy Bourgeois, he, he needs prayers. Uh, I heard, I talked to Tommy the other day, Bourgeois. I uh, <laughs> talked to you today, just a minute ago. But uh, Tommy Bourgeois, I talked to him the other day. Um, 
In fact, it was yesterday. But uh, anyway, he seems to be doing well. But he's got a long road ahead. But he seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, it, the the issue is his kidneys, and I believe he's got cancer on his left kidney. I believe, I believe that. But also, I have a friend of mine, um, a really good couple. They they over they're over the Christian school uh, named Derek and Hannah Tate. They're pregnant, expecting a, a little girl, and that little um, that little girl I think is due like in a like a month, a few weeks, something. It well. I, it's around the corner. It's April. April it's uh, anyway. She's been having complications. She's been having, they've been going to the doctor a lot of that. So we need to pray for them that everything uh, can go well. That it can be you know that due date that is in April. Um, so so those are some of my requests. Um, of course, uh, you know continue prayers. Justin over here, he's an engaged man. Need to pray, pray for that wedding coming along, you know, and everything. So yeah. can't sneak in here without me calling it out. But, uh, but yeah, anyhow. Uh, anyway, other prayer requests. Who's that? It's Charlie Starnes. Charlie Starnes. Okay. Okay, keep Shirley Starnes in our prayers. And John, were you saying about Ken there with his loss of his mother? Yes, uh, I need to keep Ken and his family in prayers, certainly. Katie Ledbetter. Katie Ledbetter, yeah. Yeah, she's sick now, yeah. There's yeah. Here's a little baby named Piper um, that has a birth defect. Right? He has a brain disorder. And so we need to keep that baby in our prayers. Okay. Just one. The, the certain um, thing disorder the baby was born with the life expectancy is just measured in a couple of years. And so the family is really struggling. They haven't grown home for my senior year. The type of the little group. Well, then, uh, Pastor Norma fell <coughs> on the steps after her Ash Wednesday service mm -hmm. at the church. And I think she was supposed to have a Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for this group here, Lord. Even though we ourselves are small, you're a great big God. You're a God who holds the entire world in your hands, Lord. And Lord, you're just so mighty, so triumphant. God, I, do, I know you've challenged me to believe in the miraculous, to believe in the uh, unthinkable. Lord, uh, I pray today that very thing. I pray the miraculous. I pray the unthinkable. Lord, I pray for dramatic healing and, and rapid growth and, and success and, and prosperity. And I pray for connection, Lord. I pray that we grow closer to you. Lord, I, I pray that if there can be just a group of 10 people, 15 people, 20 people, 5 people that can just grow closer to you and are so radical about your gospel. Lord, I pray that we can be obedient. I pray that we go into your word, go into you in prayer, go into your nature and in your love and in all things, Lord. I just pray that we can be good stewards of what you've given to us because you've blessed us so much and so often... We, we neglect to give you praise. Or many times, like the other, the nine lepers who, who went away healed, but did not come back and say thank you. So Lord, I pray that we give you thanks for how you're working in all these requests, all these situations, all these scenarios. God, I just pray your healing hand be upon them, but also that every step of the way we go closer in our relationship with you and in our devotion to you. God, I pray your blessings over this church and over the people and over this congregation and over the ones watching online. I pray blessings over everyone who comes in contact with us that they can be healed by being forgiven, by coming to you. Lord, help us point people to you. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and
sing again. Uh, stand and join me as you build my life.
Somebody say, well, when I get heaven, I'll ask. <laughs> a little late then, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if, if your faith's not strong enough to get the answer before you get there, you might not get there to ask that question. So ask the questions of God. Have a faithful relationship with Him that regardless, you can ask any question. So that's one thing that I had this week that was sort of troubling in the mind. It's how to ask that question, what should it be? A thousand questions can come to your mind in just a moment. But thanking God and praising His name is the one thing we should do, regardless of what we're asking about. Amen. And I'm asking about the offering, but we haven't passed it back. And if you've given, thank you so much. We're getting close to being in this building now a year. Just a couple more, three, four more weeks, we'll have made a year here. And it's by your gracious giving that's kept us here. And thank you all for that. Just showing up to listen for Charles. That young man has got a long way to go. Just like oh, Sophia. He oh, doesn't oh, get a little further than her. You know? uh, he's learning every day. And I'm proud to know part of that from this. Getting to know you as a group. Let's bow here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the service, Lord. May we offer our whole self to you and not be shaken by the world, Lord, because we're firm with you. We know what you ask of us. And, Lord, we ask you to keep us strong, keep us faithful to you. And Lord, we just ask for this service to be pleasing to you. That's the way of saying thanks. And we honor you are and for this day. For it is in you that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be picking up in verse 20. We, uh, we went to the first 19 verses last week, and uh, the goal is to go through the rest of Luke chapter 6. Um, pretty excited about this word. It's, uh, it's simple. I hope I don't complicate it. Um, 
Luke chapter 6, verse 20 says this. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. And live for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you who have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who will laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. And so today we're, we're picking up at Luke's account of the Beatitudes. Uh, Matthew, in his gospel, has the Beatitudes. And it serves as an introduction to this Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so as we're going into this, uh, it's, it's, it's not the exact same as Matthew's account. And it has some interesting elements to it. And I want to go ahead and go because I know we're starting in this message late. And for us to not be here all night, I'm going to go ahead and tell you some really awesome things about this sermon that he preaches. So we've seen him in action the first 19 verses of Luke chapter 6. But now we're hearing his words. We're hearing him preach. And so in this preaching, he starts off with his introduction. He says, blessed are those... And then he gives the reason. He gives those who are blessed. And then he gives woe to those. And it's the exact, it's a comparison. So he says, blessed are you who are poor. He says, woe to you who are rich. Blessed are you who hunger now. Woe to you who are well fed. Those kind of things. So he's making these comparisons. But, and that's, that's the beginning. It's interesting his sermon format. Never paid attention to it. Never really studied it as much. But in this sermon, he has an introduction which is basically the, the simple blessings and woe. Who should be um, encouraged? Who should be convicted? Every time a sermon is preached, you're going to encourage some, and you're going to convict others. Or you're going to call out others. You might not convict them, but you preach. So that's how it starts out. With, but then he ends up telling us to love our enemies. And then he ends up telling us to judge not uh, judging others. And so... so and then he ends up saying this parable. So he says, you know, we love our enemies, we judge not, and then he wants to give us an image. And the image is that a tree of a certain type will have a certain type of fruit. You can't just mix it, and, and, and so, so if it's a bad tree, it's not gonna, it's not gonna have good fruit. If it's a, if it's a good one, it's not gonna have bad. And so he's telling people, this is a sign that if you love your enemies, and if you judge not, those are fruit of what it means to be a good believer, or what it means to be a godly person, a godly Christian. And then it goes to that song that we just sang, the word, the line that sticks in my mind is that firm foundation. And Jesus closes in Luke chapter 6 with that firm foundation. So who's the ones who have the firm foundations? The ones who believe in God, who are humble enough to come to Him under salvation, but the fruits of that is loving, not just loving your best buddies, your spouse, and your brother and sister. No, it's loving your enemies, the ones who you don't want to see, loving those people, and then choosing not to judge. So let's dive into it. And in verse 20, he, he says that looking at his disciples, he said, so if you remember, we assembled all of the disciples now. The, the whole team is put together and it says at them, but also the people who were around. If you remember, and, and for context, it said in verse 17, he went down with them, stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there and a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem, coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him. And, and they were healed of their diseases, they were healed of their ailments, they were forgiven of their sins, all these different things Jesus did. 
And so uh, this is all very reflective of Matthew's gospel, but he makes some comparisons here. So in verse 20, he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The poor equals the kingdom of God. Those who are poor get the kingdom of God. Poor people generally realize their need for salvation. And this is not just by financial wealth, even though, yes, it is true. Um, those who, who, who are very well off and have worked for their own, their own business and worked for their own life and worked for their own house, they tend to think that they're the ones who got it. But no, God gave it to them. God provided it for it. But when you are poor in spirit and you realize you're a sinner, the spiritual side, when you realize you're a sinner and you are in need of saving, says those people are blessed. Also, those people who are, uh, you know, a lot of times if you're in more of a humble situation in life, it's easier to see that. So it kind of goes twofold in that way. But spiritually, it's so important for us to know when you're guilty of sin and you realize you're guilty of sin, you realize you're deserving of hell, that is the poor. And there's that repentance. There's that repentance. It says that they have the kingdom of God. Verse 21 says, Blessed are you who are hu who hunger now. Notice hunger now. For you, it says, For you will be satisfied. For you will be filled forevermore. If you're longing for God, if you're hungry for the Word of God, you're hungry for what God can do. You know, one thing, folks, that we need to be challenged about is we need to remember that God is a God of omnipotence and omniscience. And He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-perfect. And He can work miracles. And so often we get used to the daily life and we get used to just going through the motions of going to church and reading our Bibles and praying, that's great. But sometimes we end up being so used to, okay, this person died, this person didn't get better, this, uh, this situation didn't fold out. And so we kind of just start thinking that God doesn't want to help us anymore. But we don't need to pray for these big, great miracles because we are discouraged by, you know, maybe other uh, prayers haven't been answered. But folks, we need to remember and we need to be hungry for God. We need to be hungry and say, you know what, Lord, I believe you can do it. Even if you don't, I'm still going to worship you. Even if you don't answer my prayer, I'm still going to believe for it. And so we need to hunger for God. The next thing he says is for you who weep now, you're going to laugh, you're going to rejoice, you're going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's so interesting in this scripture, if we're talking about the spiritual side of it, is, and I've used this before with funerals before, people who are weeping, you know, God will comfort, and I think it has an element of that too. But when I really think about the daily struggles of Christian life, what is it that Christians daily struggle with? Well, we struggle with our sins, we struggle with these habits that we want to get rid of, like we hate our, our, we hate the nature that we have. Like Paul said, he says, the things that I don't want to do, I do them. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do them. And I believe that's the daily Christian struggle. That we, we, we struggle with sin, we struggle with habits, we struggle with addictions that we want to be free of. Uh, for those of you who are weeping because you man, it's like, I, I love God, but I keep failing and I keep messing up. He says that you will laugh. You will be in joy. You will be triumphant. You will laugh in joy over your redemption as the kingdom of heaven will wipe away every tear. The kingdom of heaven will wipe away every tear, every struggle, everything that you struggle with to deal with now, whether it be the loss of a loved one or whether it be a sin that you deal with daily that you want to be free of. One day when you're face to face with God, it will be totally taken off your shoulders, and you will be free, and you will be, have the joy, you will laugh, notice it says weep now, it says you will laugh, blessed are you, verse 22, when people hate you, when they exclude you, and insult you, and reject your name as evil, because of the Son of Man, so this is talking about persecution, it's talking about persecution, in verse 22, and then verse 23, and the persecution it says you're blessed, whenever people are going against you. When, when, they are, when they're cursing you, when they're fighting you, because you can rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Your reward in heaven is going to be so much greater. Folks, I think that we get this wrong. I know I do. 
is the fact that there's two types of fear we live our lives with. There's a fear of man, and there's a fear of God. And too often, we consider the fear of man as the most important thing. We don't fear God. No, we need to realize that the fear of God is so much greater, so much mightier. We don't have any right to be afraid of man, to have fear of man, because of how triumphant God is. Our lifespan is but a vapor to the immense eternity that God has. It, it, it is a bit of vapor, but to the immense eternity that God has. And so, when we are looking in our lives, we need to say, we need to stop being so afraid of what the news says and, and stop being afraid of, of uh, oh, I don't know if I could do this because I'm scared that I might get hurt or I'm, I'm scared of that. We, we don't have the right to be afraid of man. We can fear God and serve Him. God is the one whom we should abide into and lean on and trust in Him. Because I want to be, I want to store my treasures in heaven. Not store my treasures so that man can be satisfied with how I live my life. I want to live, I want to store my treasures in heaven. I want to be persecuted so that I can be uh, even that much more. Uh, prospered in heaven. I want to be with God. I want God to be proud of me for what I do. And He's proud of you whenever, when, when people don't like what you're standing for. And they don't like what you're representing, but you're representing Jesus Christ. That is the truth. You know, the fact is, the gospel offends people. The gospel, the name of Jesus Christ is the most controversial, divisive name there is. But when you share Jesus with others, when you share Jesus with others around you and you get persecuted, it brings joy. And I have no other way to explain that. Whenever, whenever I, I, I stand outside and I, and I try to share the gospel with somebody, and, and every blue moon there's some negativity and there's someone who's, who, who will cuss me out or will give me a, 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 tell me I'm number one but not with your index finger. Whenever those kind of things happen, there's some type of joy that gets in you, and it's only through the Holy Spirit, because I promise you, if there's any other type of rejection I could have in any, about any other type of subject, any other type of topic, I will be crushed, but not when I'm standing on the gospel of Christ. Supernatural joy, which only confirms God's presence in your life. When you get persecuted, it only confirms God's presence in in your life. So don't be afraid of man. Don't be afraid of man. Verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. You don't need a savior if you are satisfied with how you are. You don't feel the need. Who goes to the doctor? The ones who know they need one. You're, if you are rich, you, you don't feel like you need a Savior. If you are full, you, you think, I don't need any more. I don't need to go out of my comfort zone. I'm satisfied where I am. It says that you'll be empty forevermore. If you laugh now and you think, oh man, I got the joy, I'm living it up, it's probably the closest to heaven you'll ever be. Mourning and weeping is going to take place. Uh, false prophets were well spoken of uh, because they never called out sin. And so all these kind of things, all these woes they're talking about, so crucial. That's how he begins this message. But then he tells us in verse 27, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, Turn to them the other also. If one takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Jesus tells us one of the most important aspects of the church, and that is love. Love is one of the most important aspects of the church. What is interesting is that he does not just say, love your closest friends. Do a better job at loving your spouse. Don't, don't just love the pastors around you. Why? Because it's easy to love them. Enemies are difficult to love. The ones who you hate are difficult to love. Verse 31 gives us a golden rule. And you know what's interesting is that in, the, in pretty much every religion, they have some type of form of the golden rule. 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's interesting. Pretty much every religion has a golden rule, but the Bible is the one that uses it in the context about your enemies. About the enemies, not the ones you like, not the ones that are preferred, not those. No, your enemies. It says them here in verse 32. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, uh, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Folks, we think we deserve a lot. We have so much entitlement in the way that we live. But the truth is that we are not entitled to a single part particle of this earth. We're not entitled to anything. We are in total deservement of punishment for eternity, but God is so gracious and merciful. We have no right to withhold mercy and forgiveness to our enemies and to those around us, and especially to those who are your friends and your spouses and your close ones and all those kind of things. We have no right to hold, withhold mercy. Lend and love. You shouldn't desire return. You shouldn't desire uh, to get everything back. Spouses should love and forgive even if they're not getting it back. Be merciful. Constantly living in mercy and love. Verse 37, he talks about judgment now. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Forgiveness. Do you want freedom in your life? Do you want to stop feeling uh, this shackles on your life? Even though you believe in Jesus, even though you read the Bible, even though you trust God, but you still feel a weight bearing down on you? Have you taken an inventory time to think, have I forgiven everyone in my life? Have I forgiven those who hurt me in my past? Have I forgiven those who have done me wrong? We need to examine all the time who is it that we need to forgive. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe you need to forgive yourself. If you want freedom, you must forgive. And there must be no judgment. Give it and it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you also. So when we tend to look at that person that walks in or, or goes around in the store and you see them and you, you, you have that natural judgment, we need to remember the judgment we use on someone else will actually be our own test. That will be a judgment. Ooh. We need to lower our standards then if we're, getting, if, we're, if we're being judged that way. I know that's what I took it as. Verse 39, it says... He also told this parable, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Here's a big reference to Proverbs. Uh, and he's preaching this, uh, you know, scribes and Pharisees, you know, they, they really believe that they're leading other people to the truth. But he said, Can the blind lead the blind? Can the scribes and Pharisees who are blind to the gospel lead others to the gospel? Absolutely not. One must be renewed and changed. You know, in, in the scripture, it talks about being uh, fully trained. It says, <clears throat> the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. The fully trained is the fully renewed, the one who is born again, who believes in Christ. Verse 41, it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The tendency of mankind, of all people, is to examine other's sin. Objectively speaking, I can see other people's sins better than I can myself, or at least I'm more honest about it. Where it's easy to see the flaws of other people. 
It's easy to see when someone else doesn't, doesn't seem as put together as well. And, and it's so easy. But so far in this sermon, Jesus has taught two primary things. Love your enemies and judge not. The next verses, these next verses conclude this lesson. Verse 43 says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks of the heart is full of. It says in this that you will have fruit of your relationship with God. There are signs, there are fruit of your relationship. And Jesus makes a very clear point. If you really look at it, Jesus says, if you love your enemies, if the world sees a man or a woman who loves their enemies and judges not, that is a godly person. That is a, a renewed person. That is a Christian. That is someone different. Jesus ends with this question in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Lord, Lord. That's why the title of the message is Master. Who is your Master? This word Lord is meaning the Master of your life. You can call Him Lord all day, but if He's not the Master of your life, if He is not truly the Lord that is an authority of your life, if that authority is not shaping you to love your enemies and to not judge and to lean on God more than ever, if that is not the case for you, then He's not the Lord. He's not saying... It's not, people get this confused so often. They say, Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. That people get confused by that. They say, oh my goodness. It's like, uh, I, I've been saying Jesus is Lord, and I've been saying Lord and Lord... That's not the point. It's not about a title. It's about your lifestyle. Is He the master of your life? Is He the Lord of your life? Does He call the shots in your life or do you call the shots in your life? You can call Him Lord but not mean it at all. You can also call Him Lord and mean it. Then verse 47 says, As for everyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are. Life. Those three things. He says, come to me, hear my word, and put into practice. Those three things. Coming to him. What does that look like today? What does it look like to come to him? Acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge your sinfulness. Your brokenness. You acknowledge your depravity. You come to him. And then hear my word. Realizes that Jesus saved you. That's a practical way. Realizing that Jesus saved you through the Word. That, that Jesus, you can go to His Word, you can read it, but one of the biggest principles that the Bible teaches is that Jesus died on the cross to save you when you realize that and then put into practice. That's the next part of the verse. Put into practice. That means that you live victoriously by reading your word, praying to God, studying uh, His ways, and telling others about the gospel. When you, when you believe it and you do what it says. See, so we're so good in the church. Evangelical churches, conservative churches are pretty good at calling out their own sinfulness. I'll, I'll say that. They're really good about calling out sin. And then many, many churches all across the world are very good about Bible study and looking at verses and, and, and hearing preaching, all these kind of things. So come to me and hear my word. Those first two things are very good, mostly. But the third thing, that really is where the rubber hits the road, puts into practice. Puts into practice lives that victorious life, lives that life of reading the Word and allowing it to really apply and to really change, lives the Word. That right there is a challenge for me, and I believe that it will be a challenge for you as well. Verse 48, it says, they, For those of you who come to me 
hear my word, and put into practice what I say. When you do that, you are like, in verse 48, they are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not, uh, struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. When you come to the Father, come to Jesus, when you hear what He says and do it, put it into practice, that is like building a house on a firm foundation. And it's not the fact that it's just great of your firm foundation. It's, it's when the storms come. It's when the wind blows. It's when the trials of life happen. When the death and when the depressions hit. And when all of the, the sincerity and the severities of life hit you and it's right in your face. You're not going to be blown down. You will not be broken to pieces. You will not be defeated. And then there's the consequences for someone who does not trust. Someone who does not believe. Someone who does not actively make the Lord or Jesus master of their life. It is, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. It's just my question is, and that's my conclusion, who is your master? Have you made Jesus the master of your life? I, I believe the people here today, I believe you, many of you have really made Jesus the savior of your life, and, and that's what gets you into heaven. I know that. I believe that about most everyone here. But what I want to challenge you with is that there's so much more to the story. The real challenge is, who's your master today? You can bank on going to heaven one day and saying, oh, I believe in him. That's good. I'm not trying to go against it. But I'm saying, who is your master today? Are you living like Jesus is your master? Are you living like Jesus is your Lord? That's my question I want to end with today. To really think about, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Are you coming to Him? Are you hearing His Word? And are you putting it into practice? Let's pray together. Dear God, I thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You for just letting it come alive to my life, Lord. I just pray, uh, Lord, that You uh, bless this, this congregation. Uh, Lord, challenge us, teach us to love, to 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 not judge those who just really seem to grind our gears. Lord, I just pray that we are totally merciful because you have been totally merciful to us. We don't deserve your grace. We don't deserve your mercy. So, Lord, I just pray that we can really remember that. We can live it, abide in it. God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit really be challenging the hearts today, Lord, uh, to make you master, to make you Lord of our lives. Lord, I just pray this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. 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 I invite you all to stand and join in singing our last song. Yeah.
is a price drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. Grace is an ocean we'll all see. And the heaven gates earth like unforeseen. Regrets when I think about the way that he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. Given are held as close to you as far as the east is from the west. They are that far away from each other that you are that redeemed, you are that victorious, you are that forgiven. Make the Jesus the master of your life tonight. Yes. Dear God, I pray your blessings over this group here. Challenge us, Lord. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, I was supposed to be there that night. I was sick. I didn't feel 